Oh, hello everyone. Uh Setkama, Setkama Ya, C B Ta, Alhoxi, Naya. Um, hello, how are you all? Uh here to speak humbly on behalf of Indian Collective. My name is Robbie Burroughs. I'm from Mahikolana. I'm an enrolled member of the Dry Creek Rancheria Band of Pomo Indians. Um traditionally from Northern California, pretty close to here. So I'm very grateful and uh, very appreciative to be here to speak with you all. Um, I grew up not too far from here, uh, Santa Rosa, and spent a lot of time in, in these areas. Um, I'm now residing on Nishinan and Maidu lands in Sacramento, so still not too far away. Um, and again, just, just very honored to be here. You now we have a smaller crowd, but I'm I'm curious if anyone out there has heard of Indian Collective before. No, no. Yeah, a couple in the back. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. So Indian Collective. Um it's an indigenous nonprofit. It's based out of Rapid City, South Dakota. Uh, a lot of Oglalas out there. It was uh the Pine Ridge Reg Reservation. Um, it was established to to combat some some problems that were going on out there. Uh, we'll go to the next slide, and it'll kind of give an intro of our of our upbringing and kind of what we do. We were a school awardee last year. Um, and if you could play the video, please. I was running the Thunder Valley Community Development. Might have to go to the actual YouTube it's playing on. Just give us one second, please. Working through. Here we go. Sometimes those embedded videos don't don't work. I was properly. running the Thunder Valley Community Development Corporation. We were doing affordable housing development, food sovereignty work. All of it was place based right there in my home community. We were doing amazing work there. And so we got reached out to by about 70 different indigenous communities who wanted to do something similar to what we were doing. I've always kind of been an open book. Whatever we are successful at, we'll, we'll share with those communities. But he said, you've got to come here because we have no capacity to help you. Mm -hmm. In the midst of me thinking about how do you help these other communities, we were fighting the Dakota Access Pipeline. And man, when we didn't win that fight, it was devastating to our movement, to our people. But when I started thinking about it, I was like, what could our movement look like if we had resources? We actually were funded. Let's create an intervention that really challenges the status quo. And I started thinking grant funds, startup funds, capacity, lending dollars. We need to kick down doors that have been closed on our people. In almost every indigenous language in the world, there is a word or a phrase that we are all connected. In my language, in Lakota, we say midakoye oyase, which means that we are all related. All people, all living things, all systems. And what has happened in the world has actually tried to silo those things out. And that has compounded problems like global climate change, furthering the separation between the rich and the poor declining education for young people, destruction of the environment. And we have built systems around extractive approaches to meeting the needs of people and that we need to actually shift into regenerative models that help regenerate biodiversity, regenerate economies, regenerate the human spirit of the people. And so our work here at the Indian Collective is 
really focused on shifting the power back into the hands of indigenous people who this power has been taken throughout history. NDN operates from a fairly simple theory of change. We believe that when indigenous people are accessed and have resources in an appropriate way to answer the problems they're facing through development, defending and decolonizing, not only can we build regenerative and sustainable systems to affect positive change in our communities, but we have the keys and solutions to help all of humanity address some of the most trying times of modernity. Defending air, land, water rights, and community, fighting on the front lines and defending Mother Earth. At the same time that we're defending, we have to be developing developing regenerative and inclusive economies that are based on indigenous values and indigenous principles, and then decolonize, supporting the work of revitalizing indigenous languages, ceremonies, life ways, and decision-making structures. The majority of the north side of Rapid is one of the most underinvested communities in town, and in, it's majority native. And so one of our goals is to do redevelopment here that meets the needs of our, our, our community and our people. Less than half of 1% of philanthropic dollars make it to Indigenous-led organizations every year. And so our theory of change is not to actually go into those institutions and to get them to behave differently. Our theory of change is create new philanthropic institutions and grant-making organizations that have lived experience, that have come up through the movement, and shift money and decision-making power into Indigenous-led organizations. <laughs> We do the community action grants to fund frontline organizing that have to do with water rights campaigns, the issue of missing Indigenous women, education mobilizations, the Land Back campaign. The Land Back campaign is, at its core, the literal reclamation of Indigenous lands. It's the reclamation of everything stolen from us. And so that is our ceremony, our language, our spirituality, our culture, but it's also like our kinship systems, our education, healthcare, housing, our governance systems. All of these were based on our relationship to the land. And so Land Back represents the reclamation of an entire culture. At the same time that we push and change for policies, we're also ones that are creating some of those solutions. So we don't just push for education policy. We're actually developing something called the Osheti Shakoi Community Academy. We don't just shift the policy to impact unsheltered relatives. We're actually building a tiny house community. We have within their organization, this broad scope of work happening. We have our, our organizers and the Indian action team who are like really deeply rooted in their communities and our grant making arm was able then to connect with those people on the ground and identify like, what support do you need? How can we show up for you? Can we amplify your efforts or your fight? There's just this really beautiful interconnectedness. I see Indian Collective as an organization, but so much more than that, you know, it's it's people that are that are challenging the ways that we've always seen the world. We believe that those closest to the pain have to be those creating the solution for themselves and for their communities. And our model of defend, develop, decolonize is not just a mission statement. It is a path forward for humanity. Awesome. Thank you for the help on the video. So yeah, that's Indian Collective in a nutshell. Um, our history we grew out of uh, Thunder Valley Community Development Corporation that was founded on the Pine Ridge Reservation uh, to make affordable housing for, for our relatives on that reservation. Um, he's like a big brother to me, Nick Tilson, our president and CEO, the founder. He saw a need, um, you know, historically, anthropologists come into indigenous communities um, they assess a problem and then they try to create solutions that they think will will help indigenous communities. 
Uh, and that doesn't always work out. So what he saw and, you know, what our model is, is essentially just to trust us with the money. We know what our problems are and we'd like the, the power to make decisions for ourselves to help our community. A lot of we do is based in spiritualness, connectedness, um, and really caring for the entire community. And so it's hard for us to see, you know, outsiders come in and tell us how to tackle a problem rather than, you know, let, let us um, assess the problem and, and try to grow out of it. So now we've grown, we've grown tremendously in the last five years. It was just an idea, a thought uh, this time five years ago. And now we're one of the biggest indigenous uh, nonprofits in Turtle Island and across the nation. Uh, and we're really trying to set an interne international example of how to do this well and to scale it up for other indigenous communities, uh, indigenous communities that are in need. There are some core areas that, that we focus on, resource rematriation, community development and social enterprise, lending and impact investing. And then maybe our core function is organizing policy and advocacy. Uh, and we are doing this all through through Indian Collective. Our our mission statement, um, I'll just read it for you guys. Build the collective power of indigenous peoples, communities, and nations to exercise exercise our inherent right to self-determination while fostering a world that is built on a foundation of justice and equity for all people in Mother Earth. So that's really at the core of our vision um, through all our development work, through all our defend work and through our decolonization work. Uh, we keep that we keep that centered and focused And our vision. It's, it's pretty simple. Just a world that is just and equitable for all people in Mother Earth um, and really bringing that connection to people in Earth in the land uh, and back. So our three Four areas, again, are defend, develop, decolonize. Um, and through this, we, you know, we defend traditional ways, indigenous people, and our natural resources, water, um, earth. For developing is communities. Usually you think of develop and community uh, development as just construction. But we try to go beyond that and develop indigenous peoples and communities and nations in a regenerative and sustainable manner, uh, connecting those land-based principles, cultural and, and identity. And then, of course, decolonization. That's, that's a big one for us um, because we love who we are. We're indigenous people. And for a long time, I know with my family too, you know, sometimes you had to be quiet about that in certain areas and around certain uh, communities or people. And um, it's a beautiful thing to, you know, be indigenous, be who you are and be able to um, live the life, you know, you and your family have always had in a world that is just and equitable for all people and the mother earth. So again, our, our keys, um, our resource rematriation, that's our foundation group. Uh, we call them the grantee aunties. This is one of our core functions. They are the ones really making a difference. They um, are uh, increasing their philanthropic investment into indigenous-led organizations, communities and people, tribes, movements. So we have eight different funding stream over 44 million in grants to date, uh, with another 50 million, thanks to the Bush Foundation coming on later this year to help indigenous people get into housing, to get into small businesses, to build capacity. Um, there was a, a good deal of money just for COVID-19 response efforts. And we've been able to support 150, the list is growing. We're almost at 200 organizations um, through our community self-determination grant. So we have a few uh, community self-determination grant, a change makers fellowship, community action fund, and a radical imagination grant that cycle throughout the year. Um, so we open applications, uh, welcome and encourage anyone to apply. Uh, more info is at our website, indiancollective.com. Uh, but this is to support um, 
indigenous future leaders and even people that are doing it as we speak uh, through community self-determination. Usually it's like a two-year grant cycle where we commit anywhere from 50,000 to 100,000 per grantee per year. Um, so it's it's quite an investment uh, that we are making, but it the impact is is really amazing. Uh, another one of our core functions is lending and impact investing. Uh, we want to make sure we increase the capital uh, for indigenous led organizations, communities, peoples, tribes, and movements. Um, as everyone knows that started a business or try to start a business, it takes time, it takes resources. Um, and so by lending directly and uh, building our capacity to be able to lend and to be able to invest in Indigenous-led organizations is definitely a key function for us. Uh, Kim Pate uh, leads that group and our Indian Fund team. Uh, we call them the Indian Fund because uh, they put the fun in fund. <laughs> it's a it's a great group, but they they've almost had seven million in investments raised to date. Uh, with another $5 million planned for this year. Um, and then an additional two hundred and fifty, just over $250,000 in power building resources. So they'll take uh, startups, you know, uh, kids, community members just out of college or just trying to get a business going and help them with their initial stages and commit their time and resources into building out business plans, to building out a plan uh, for the future and and how to create a sustainable business. Um, so far, we have nine businesses and projects supported to date. Uh, the Chicago Construction Company out of the Rosebud Sioux territory in uh, North Dakota, South Dakota, that's a big one. There is an indigenous school down in Pasadena, California that I, I won't butcher the name for. Um, but it's a school, an indigenous-led school that they just supported and just closed on that that I know they're very excited for. Uh, the Community Development and Social Enterprise Arm, uh, that's, the, that's the group I run. Uh, so I'm the managing director for Indian Holdings, LLC, and that's the for-profit side of Indian Collective. So it's our for-profit holding company owned by the collective that exist to build assets and get land back by transitioning land, real estate, and building ownership through strategic land acquisition opportunities. And really where this came about was with our headquarter building. Um, so Indian Collective leased a space in downtown Rapid City. Um, we wanted to do a mural on the side of our building to showcase uh, indigenous artists and to liven up the building a little bit. And originally the landlord said we could, but then when it came down to it, uh, he changed his mind and didn't want any painting, anything, no banners, no posters being held. Uh, so we decided to go out and purchase our own building. Uh, we retrofitted it and then turned it into the very own Indian HQ, um, where we were able to paint every side of the building with an indigenous mural. So that's kind of where the idea came from and started. And then our very next project was uh, the KXL pipeline. It was a proposed pipeline running through the Dakotas, Minnesota, all the way down, connect to Texas and the Gulf of Mexico. And it ran right through a couple different Indian uh, reservations. Um, and there was two big parcels of land totaling about 900 acres that were up for auction. And so we actually, our holding company stepped in and purchased those, um, that land uh, right there, then and there. And so it was a key um, avenue for the pipeline. And we were able to kind of hold on to that, to rally around it, to uh, direct action around it and help stop, I won't say we're directly responsible for stopping the KXL pipeline, because that took a ton of effort uh, from a ton of different groups, but it was part of it. Um, and so now we're transitioning that land back to uh, RST, the Rosebud Sioux tribe. And, you know, we didn't buy it for land speculation or looking for appreciation. We were just transitioning that land back to them for, for the cost we put into it. 
and it worked out very well. So it gives you an idea of, you know, our holding company is just not a traditional business where it's all about bottom line profits. Um, we lead the development of the Osheti Shikoi Community Academy. It's a K-12 indigenous school um, that we started this year. It's operating out of a church right now, and we have plans to build an 80 to 90,000 square foot uh, school for the future leaders of the Osheti Shikoi, uh, building out a curriculum around traditional ways. Um, so it's very exciting to work on, to be part of the community development and social prize arm. Uh, we have a land and power building fund. So we've invested about $11 million into place-based projects. That includes the school. That includes Gleun. It's a tiny home community for our unhoused relatives. We're building tiny homes um, to help with, as, as you guys know, everywhere, there's uh, problems with housing stability, housing insecurity. Uh, so to be able to build this tiny home community to try to help lessen that burn, burden is a, is a great project for us. We're also uh, invested in about three different affordable housing projects, um, one duplex, one triplex, and then one 18 to 24 unit uh, complex that'll go to uh, first our Indian Collective employees, our organizers, um, and then local community members that meet certain income thresholds. Uh, but we're trying to combat, uh, you know, just housing prices. And in California, it's crazy, but everywhere else too. And so we have a current asset value of around 24, 25 million right now. We're projected to double that in the next three years, just with some of these projects coming online. Um, we've got about 11 development projects in the work right now. And as I mentioned, I kind of run it. So I'm trying to leave it at that amount because there are quite a lot of projects and work going on. Um, the, the, our fourth table, and again, this is kind of one of our biggest key sections of Indian Collective is the organizing policy and advocacy. Uh, Nick Tilson, our president and CEO, was a community organizer first and foremost. Um, and he was able to, you know, help. He's from Pine Ridge. He was, has ties there, um, built out Thunder Valley just through his work, uh, fundraising and organizing. Uh, a key thing we do is NVDA. So that's nonviolent direct action. So everything we do is in a nonviolent manner. Um, but we're not afraid to show up and speak out for the things that, we see some of the injustices as well. So that's the direct action component. We firmly believe in the right to organize, to advocate, and, and to help build indigenous-led movements. Um, so, so far to date, through our organizing policy and advocacy, we'd help support 20 billboards place. I know there's a couple on Ohlone territory, and this is across like Turtle Island. It's it's pretty crazy. We get pictures. You never know where they they pop up. Um, creative resistance is a huge part of our nonviolent direct action. Uh, so a couple of the projects here locally, um, we protested, or I should say, direct action against BlackRock, and we got uh, grandmothers union, uh, local school groups to all come out in downtown uh, San Francisco and to paint sidewalks and to kind of stop business as usual for the day and to really send a message. And it's it's a great time when you can get a bunch of uh, kids, all, all ages from like six to 96, it seems like that we're out there for a same cause and uh, to really show up and, and do it in a nonviolent manner and to be able to you know, speak justice to power. Is that what we say? And then, as I mentioned, we uh, we officially launched one school, uh, the Osheti Shikoi Community Academy. So that's in the early stages now. And uh, we're, we're helping to build that out as we talk. So measuring impact, this is a huge thing. And this is one of our, our key components to, to keep growth and to um, really set Indian Collective on a sustainable path. Uh, I'll 
most of our money is raised through philanthropy. And one of the key things is how do you measure that impact? So we have a ton of awards, we have a ton of data, a ton of pictures, but still to put that data into, um, you know, a, a, a PowerPoint has always been uh, a struggle, but we're we're doing our best for it, right? It is. So our evaluation indicators can be grouped into three categories, financial power, social power, and political power. Um, so we're trying to build power amongst all these things for indigenous people. So increased funds, philanthropic and private, flowing towards indigenous self-determination, more indigenous people living above the poverty line, and uh, community ownership, ownership over utilities and strong infrastructure. A lot of the problems um, a lot of tribes and our people are facing today are over faulty infrastructure, access to clean water. So to be able to to build that and and help these projects is definitely something we're invested in. Um, social power again promoted. Um, the just speaking about the challenges and opportunities facing Indigenous people, and in language, language is so vital to us. Every tribe has its own dialect and different uh different groups so bringing back the language is a huge thing for us as well um because that's how we you know connect with the land connect with our people and um brings us closer to the the creator or spiritual um uh, spiritual values and then of course getting the legal infrastructure in place to indigenous values and customs because you you have to have the paperwork in today's day and age. You have to have that pretty buttoned up. And then, of course, greater political power is promoted, too. So we want to increase the passage of legislation that protect Indigenous people. Uh, there's more tribal peoples and um, getting elected into office these days as we speak. So that's a great thing. And we, we want to keep building that out. Um, as I mentioned, increase the number of indigenous people holding political office. And then it's really that decisions about indigenous people land need indigenous people's approval, not just cold consultation, not just like, hey, this is what we think we should do. We're going to do it. Um, we really think that indigenous people need the power over their own lands and communities. Um, to be able to combat the problems that are out there. And then um, in the same thing with schools and different corporations as well, because um, we, you know, we center different things and not just necessarily bottom line or how the money flows. It's really based about land and earth and traditional values. I guess that, that was it. So... I can pause there. Maybe we could do some Q and A. That went that went by quicker than I thought. Thanks. <laughs> oh, the fake out. Oh, yeah. Um, I guess could you go a little more into depth about some of the issues with housing? facing the indigenous communities and kind of just talk a little more about that? Yeah, definitely. Great question. Um, so, and I, I bet you're wondering what's a Pomo guy doing working for Indian Collective and Oglala's and the Pine Ridge Reservation. And I kind of got connected out there because of the work they were doing in building a school, building tiny home communities. I thought that was really important to kind of focus on and work on. And, you know, out here, there's a lot of tribes have casinos, some are doing well off, some are not. Um, and then back in the South Dakotas, casinos are legal for everyone. So it's not just the tribe that gets to control it. So those communities um, are still very impacted. And then the reservations are from such uh, rural areas that it's not close to cities. The infrastructure is faulty. Um, there's, there's really limited access to clean water and clean resources. Um, so there are some families out there that have stuck close, have land, have like nicer houses, 
but a lot of people are still living, you know, out of trailer houses, their housing's falling apart. Uh, water doesn't work. It's 15, 20 miles to the closest gas station. So you have a bunch of gas you're carrying with you or have like a propane tank. Um, they're getting hit really hard with bad weather right now in the blizzard and access to um, just medical services is is extremely uh, hard and, you know, different weather and those sources. So it's it's really and then affordability. That's the other thing, too, is we have a bunch of our relatives that even have good paying jobs, but be able to uh, afford a nice house. The one thing about indigenous people, they usually have a larger family with them. So now like you're, you're having your grandparents, cousins and uncles in a two, maybe three bedroom house with one bath where you have eight people living in there. Um, so that creates challenges and it's really when something happens, there's no emergency funds, um, not a lot of opportunity for jobs. So people, you know, work in day labor and have money for today or tomorrow and can pay rent and get by. But if something were to happen, either weather related or unforeseen, um, it really creates a bind for people. And, you know, I've, I've been through the reservation a couple of times now and you see where like either um, a tree fell or there was blizzard that impacted the house. And it's just, kind of patched up and it's just like well we can't really fix it now so we're just kind of living like that until until something comes um and so again it's it's different for everybody um but in rapid city alone we did a survey and out of the unhoused population it was 72 percent were indigenous um and that that is just something, you know, we couldn't look past. And it was just like, that's, you know, a lot of people have direct ties and family. So that was part of building the tiny home community and definitely reasoning by, behind our affordable housing development is uh, our people deserve, you know, places to live. Um, and we think if you're, you have housing security, that's a good step forward in your life as well and that'll provide stability to to get a job or to build capacity did that help answer i'm sorry i'm kind of running on <laughs> i'm probably not going to reference what you listed on your measures for um success if you will but can you compare and contrast what it would look like to own and operate or control and regulate um, resources that come on and off indigenous lands, like compared to now, say, a, a business or, or an industry that serves a community, what, what would that look like in the future in the um, goal or objective? Yeah, great question. Great question. I think it would look um, a little bit like your local city model or something when people go in you apply for a permit right and there's different regulations um so i would say we would be very similar to that it would just take it one more step where we really bake in the earth component and being able sustainable for our people and for mother earth um in really you know fossil fuel extraction probably wouldn't get approved stuff like that and um i don't want to say we're, we're not gatekeepers we always say that right we don't want to be the people at the gate that are checking people in and out we want to hand out the keys and the for people to practice their own self-determination um but i think there is a little bit of control for lack of a better word just to see what's coming in and out right um so development standards and then um, really a plan of low impact for Mother Earth. I'd, I would say those are like the, the two main things that how I see it in the future. Mm -hmm. So you gave us a bit of background about your role, but you didn't really give us a pitch. And I'm guessing that 
some people watching this video after might have resources to contribute, either non-monetary or monetary or actual land. So I'm wondering if you have a pitch for people in the room with resources or people who might watch this later about how they can give non-monetary resources, just straight up hit donate on your website or uh, start the process of getting government land back or transferring individual real property to support all the great stuff you do. Great question. And yes, uh, we do. We're at ndncollective.com, the NDN. You have sweatshirts and t-shirts and merch or wait, you have your reports. That's right. Sorry. I thought you might have merch in the box. That was a. We do. So we do have merchandise on our website um, for everyone that came. I do have a copy of required reading. This is our climate justice book. Uh, our beautiful climate justice team put this out. So if anyone would like a copy, I'll, I'll hand them out afterwards. Awesome. Awesome. But yes, to, to everyone out there, I mean, we we firmly believe in in land back and that's land back to indigenous control and that that is um you know to protect the earth that's that's our values first and foremost and then to develop people and communities in a sustainable and regenerative manner um so one of the ways you could help is you know go on our website hit that donate button we are definitely open for uh, philanthropic dollars. I think it's and it's not for just indigenous people. You know, we we firmly believe that we have some ideas in centering the earth. Um, we'll help all people. You know, we're in a time where uh, the weather is very violent and extreme. It feels like, and we feel like. Um, Indigenous people have always centered the earth and have different ways and are against extractive industries that, you know, pollute our airways and help contribute to some of that climate. So we're definitely with partnering with different groups. Um, we're and know your money won't go to waste because our biggest team, the grantee aunties. Uh, the resource rematriation, they do a ton of work and it goes directly into grassroots, bottom up organizing into people that are on front lines. And part of the reason you don't see Indian Collective like headquarters and different parts of each state and kind of like a franchise model is uh, we want first to be invited into the community. We don't want to seem like our way is the only way to go um we'll, we'll offer to help when we're invited and then also we we firmly believe in indigenous self-determination and self-determination for all people and if that means we provide capacity and resources um to someone's tribe community or just individual that that's what we firmly believe in and that we will do we don't want to just hoard all the money for ourselves, for lack of better words. So uh, we're, we're definitely open to hear, uh, to hear about different creative partnerships, to hear about land back opportunities, um, and to build indigenous self-determination. So, so please reach out if anyone's interested. Yeah. Can I get you for the recording? Uh, thank you. It's, um, and the political power uh, and dominated white power in this case, because the majority is white people in mm -hmm. the political situation. Um, I would like to hear the uh, campaigns, uh, strategies, uh, what you're doing to put people in position there, uh, because it's, it's very difficult. Yeah. Uh, money is very important to put. Uh, and uh, and I'll, I can refer to uh, in Mexico, mm -hmm. uh, the Zapatistas uh, uprising mm -hmm. brought all these issues. Uh, you you do, in different. Uh, I mean, and the the perspective is good. The, the fight is good. Mm -hmm. Everything is uh, looks like uh, you know. I, I wanna after living here, I wanna go and do something. You know. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, but the Zapatista uprising was, and now the Zapatistas control mm. one region in the south of Mexico. 
mm -hmm. with the no government in interfering at all. And mm -hmm. it's the same, uh, what do you say? Well, the, the, uh, the, the same fight. I mm -hmm. mean, the indigenous people mm -hmm. in Mexico is indigenous people oh, in this country too. Yeah. But I did want uh, just uh, if you want to explain a little more the campaign strategies to put uh, indigenous people in uh, in power, you no, know, in the the political aspect. You no, know? thank you. Yeah, thank you for your question. Appreciate it. Um, we do have to be a little careful because of political uh, rules from a nonprofit from a five hundred one c three and to be able to uh, donate to different political campaigns. So we found that out very early and created our uh, Indian Action Network, which is a 501c4, which helps us directly contribute to uh, different indigenous candidates. Um, so I know one, and, and again, we can't take full credit for getting in, anyone into office, but uh, Deb Holland, she's Native American and she made it in. Uh, she has close connections with us and actually toured the Hey Sapa um, last summer because that's one of our big fights uh, to get the Hey Sapa uh, Mount Rushmore back in under indigenous control. Um, so one of the ways we do do that is either through direct political uh, contributions to different candidates in different states. Um, we we don't do too much in actual tribal elections. Because that's that's a little different, right? And and definitely political as well. Um, but it is something that uh, our nonviolent direct action, our local organizing team, we have a couple key areas that we are combating: climate justice, environmental justice, racial equity, education equity, um, directly back in Rapid City but then indirectly through other groups or political candidates that share those same values um, across the nation. So it, it's, I, I, it's something that um, we're actively working on. We don't, you know, it's a, you're walking a fine line kind of in politics sometimes, and then we have to be very careful with how the money flows in and flows out. Um, but it, Candidate, you know. mm -hmm. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Um, so that's something that. Yeah, we're we're kind of building out as time goes, and it depends on the candidate, like you're saying, every person, every situation is different. So taking our time to really understand um, what we're sinking our teeth in or behind um, is something that is is usually made at our leadership team level. Uh, we have a group of about eight to 10. I think there's 10 of us now um, that we talk through on pretty consistent basis. And as we ramp up towards the next election cycle, that's something that, uh, that we are committed to. It's mainly um, in the South Dakota region, just, just because that's where our organization is based. Uh, but that's not to say we want to extend our reach um, anywhere. I know we contributed to a Navajo candidate um, in the last election cycle. I forget her name now. Forgive me. And then, um, yeah, we're continuing to build out. So very important, though. That's something that if we can perfect it, we're going to try. But <laughs> <laughs> all righty well i think what we like to say when we finish up early is time back and kind of like land back time back so i will pass out some copies of our book and then if anything else comes up feel free to reach out or ask but again i appreciate being here appreciate all you guys' time today so thank you all right let's do a round of applause and there is a form we ask you to fill out so we can keep getting our grants to pay our speakers and get feedback about who we should host here at Sonoma State in the future. So go ahead and fill that out online or hard copy. Thanks so much.